so as a way of introducing ourselves, uh, we are part of NVIDIA team uh, that builds and operates uh, software-defined networking uh, for large production clouds. Uh, we also happen to be, uh, I guess, the last people who stand between you and reception and the end of the conference. So uh, much appreciate you coming uh, to our session. Hopefully it will be worthwhile and please uh, collect your questions. We'll leave some time <coughs> at the end. Uh, so uh, this talk is primarily for people who try to build uh, AI clouds uh, themselves. Uh, it is certainly possible to buy a pretty large capacity from uh, CSPs and run your AI workloads uh, this way. And that's what multiple companies, including ourselves, are doing as well. Uh, but um, in our case, we had a number of requirements that basically uh, directed us to build uh, such clouds out of uh, basically open source software and commercially available hardware. And uh, the good news is that it could be done and it's probably the most efficient way of uh, doing networking uh, for such multi-node AI uh, workloads. So again, if this is something that you're looking at, would like to use or contribute uh, to the effort, then uh, this talk is for you. So uh, why, uh, uh, why accelerated hardware? Uh, I guess accelerated compute uh, for large AI workloads is not a discussion anymore. AI uh, today is a huge uh, driving factor uh, for the compute capacity in the world uh, overall. And uh, at the same time, uh, industry ability to deliver uh, such compute with traditional means, primarily with uh, general compute, with CPUs, slowed down dramatically over the last few years. Um, I guess common uh, perception, and it's probably right perception, is that the Moore's law slows down and might uh, even come to a halt in a few years. And the best way uh, to deliver compute part is to have uh, basically accelerated compute, primarily GPUs and similar hardware. A lot of the same arguments are valid for networking as well. Uh, so historically, if you look at uh, history of the network, uh, we had uh, jumps in Ethernet uh, speed roughly by 10x now and when, basically when Ethernet standard catches up. And when that happened, a lot of uh, industry efforts typically went into hardware acceleration. And that's why today in pretty much any commercially available host hardware, you have things like um, checksum of load and other flows that kind of uh, prove to be durable over time. And then of course, uh, in the next few years, uh, general compute uh, caught up and it was possible to do networking in software and run it in line rate uh, for the most part. And then hardware acceleration efforts uh, slowed down. And right now, arguably, we are in this uh, fast network slow host scenario uh, for quite some time. And then there are specific additional requirements uh, in accelerated uh, compute for uh, large AI workloads that make uh, such hardware accelerations um, even more uh, necessary. In particular, uh, acceleration for overlays, acceleration for open virtual switch, uh, something which is pretty much a must-have in such clouds and uh, this is something that drove us to pick an uh, open source project which is uh, very amenable to acceleration and at the same time uh, it kind of works both, uh, both ways. Uh, traditionally uh, the best open source projects uh, durable and uh, valid over time were the ones that uh, took advantage of hardware acceleration, in particular for applications like uh, infrastructure for large AI workloads. So if you look at uh, basically infrastructure and fabric uh, that is required to run uh, basically compute over very large number of uh, GPUs, and that requires fabric, of course, because uh, such uh, workloads require number of GPUs well, well in excess of single node. Uh, we have typically uh, two types of uh, networking. Uh, one is what we call north-south. And uh, this is something that is typically, um, in addition to performance requirements, uh, has very stringent security requirements. 
and in the open source universe that comes primarily if you run your computer on Kubernetes, uh, that is primarily Kubernetes networking uh, policies that have to be implemented <coughs> preferably in hardware uh, rather than in software, mainly because uh, they have to hang together uh, with performance itself. And traditionally, performance is done through uh, type of bypass, the most common way to get high performance in your network and run it at line rate essentially with minimal host resources is to bypass the most problematic uh, software uh, layers. It might be either virtualization layer and that's you know why people use this RIV as one of the ways kind of a RIV directly to Kubernetes pod uh, to get high performance. Uh, or they use uh, things like RDMA and it allows to bypass uh, essentially uh, legacy stack like TCP and again your performance uh, goes up. The problem is um, in this case uh, the layers that are being bypassed are exactly the same layer that deliver security and uh, networking isolation. And uh, that's where hardware comes in and uh, things like programmable SRIV and programmable uh, RDMA uh, save, uh, save the day. The other part of uh, typical uh, cloud uh, for large AI workloads uh, have to do, has to do with east-west traffic. And historically, uh, that has been done uh, with uh, special fabrics. Uh, the whole, uh, I guess, configuration came from HPC space and over time, we had proprietary fabrics like uh, Quadrix and Dolphin and you know many other things that are now in graveyard. And uh, most recently that was InfiniBand, uh, which is still extremely uh, valid uh, way to run uh, your AI fabric. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that's what a lot of uh, deployments do. They use Ethernet for north-south and they still use uh, InfiniBand for east-west. And um, again, this is kind of get out of jail uh, card uh, for east-west traffic, uh, but at the same time, the good news is that essentially it is possible to run it on Ethernet fabric, uh, which over the last couple of years became uh, much more amenable uh, to such AI uh, workload infrastructure, mainly uh, because um, of RDMA over Ethernet, uh, which again dramatically improved over the last couple of years, primarily by solving um, the problem of link polarization and having large elephant flows kind of bumping into each other and decreasing overall uh, fabric throughput. And that's what the slide uh, typically uh, kind of tries to demonstrate. So typical bandwidth in traditional Ethernet is probably close to 60%, again, mainly because of link polarization and link saturation. And uh, with uh, essentially things like per packet routing in addition uh, to per flow routing and uh, basically solving uh, packet reordering on the host side, uh, it's possible to get uh, fabric utilization pretty close to 100% and that's what modern switches are able to achieve. Uh, so, um, the last thing I wanted to mention before I hand it off uh, to Girish and we dive into details how essentially software, open source uh, software achieves all those goals. I just wanted to point out to OVN Kubernetes project, uh, that's where the source uh, resides. Uh, please take a look. In some ways it's still a work in progress because the project right now is applying uh, to membership in Cloud Native Foundation. Uh, that's why uh, I expect uh, some documentation to improve over the next couple of months. We are getting ready for the fall uh, Open Virtual Switch Conference. Um, but in terms of the code itself, uh, I think it is in good shape uh, even for production today. And it does support a uh, number of hardware accelerations. And in general, it is fairly close to prime time, even though uh, some of examples in the documentation uh, still need improvement. And with that, uh, Girish, please walk us through some details. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, hey, everyone. This is Girish. Um, I hope I'm audible. Um, and um, so let's deep dive. Okay, we're going to deep dive into three things. One is the OSS stack on the node itself, right? What are the components on the Kubernetes node that kind of enables the STN networking? Second is the NIC adapters on this node. And third is the network fabric itself. So it's true end-to-end -end, uh, thing we're going to look at. 
Um, so before that, just a quick detour into what deep learning training in entails and what it, why is it very important to do very performant uh, inter-GPU communication. So uh, in here, you're seeing a neural network, right, with a bunch of parameters, and then this neural network is being trained with, uh, let's, say it's a, let's say the neural network is image classifier, and we are feeding this neural network with a bunch of images, and we are doing that in a batches of uh, around 256 images. The data sets itself might have millions of images, but at any given time, we are feeding the neural network with 256 images. The goal here is to classify those images, right? Um, when I run one round of uh, 256 images through the neural network, if I'm not happy with the output I get, now I have to go back through the layers of the neural network to fix the parameters of the neural network. That's called the gradient, right? It's called forward pass and backward pass. We do this a whole lot of times for all of the images in the database, and then that's one round of, uh, that's called epoch, and we do 1,000 times of epoch. If it's one GPU doing this, it might take uh, years before it completes uh, the entire uh, data set. So that's where uh, multiple GPU comes into picture, right? That's where we're uh, uh, bringing thousands of GPUs and hopefully try to converge into what we want that neural network to do in a lesser time. So we have thousands of GPUs and each GPU has the same model. In one of the, par in one of the ways to parallelize this, what we do is every GPU has the same model, but we just divide the data into various batches and then uh, provide that mini batch uh, to each of the GPU. Now, each of the GPU would compute that local gradient, right? If there are 1,000 GPUs, each GPU would have computed a local gradient that, that is specific to the batch of uh, images that came for that GPU. Now, these local gradients have to be summed across all the GPUs, right? All of 1,000 GPUs, we have to sum the gradients and create global gradient, and the global gradient is uh, applied to the parameters, and then all of those 1,000 GPUs, they move on to the next batch of images. So that's where uh, this whole MPI operation, right? All reduce, gather, scatter, all to all, one to all, all to one. So these uh, MPA operations come into picture, and these operations are the ways how GPUs talk to each other. The GPU buffers on one GPU uh, is uh, kind of pushed, the content of the GPU buffer, the gradients, whatever you want to call that, is, has to be pushed to all the other GPUs, and then they all compute the sum of it, and now they have the global gradient, and they move on to the next thing. So what becomes very important is, is this interconnect that connects all of these GPUs and all of these nodes together. So we want that interconnect to be as fast, as efficient, low latency, everything. Uh, that's where the HDN stack that, I was talk that we are talking about comes into picture. So the way, the library that is used uh, to, one of the libraries that is used to interconnect these GPUs uh, to create a high bandwidth, low latency, uh, pipe is uh, called Nickel, NVIDIA uh, Collective Communication Library. It's implemented through CUDA. CUDA is, of course, runs on top of NVIDIA GPU. And then uh, if you have a node, let's say you have a one bare metal node with uh, eight GPUs on it, and those GPUs within that bare metal node, they kind of talk to each other using PCIe or NVLink or shared memory, right? So if you have one node, the GPUs on that node talk through the PCIe backplane or NVLink. But if we have thousands of those physical nodes, and each node has eight or more GPUs, right? Now those interconnect between the physical nodes is through sockets, TCP IP sockets, or infinity band, or Rocky. So what this slide is basically saying is that uh, if you uh, look at this GPU interconnect within the node, uh, even with PCI Gen 5, the maximum you can get is around uh, 200 uh, gigabytes, gigabits per second, right? Um, uh, yeah, 50, 50 times 8, around 400 gigabit, uh, gigabit per second. And NVLink is uh, another form of interconnect between the GPUs within the node that gives you up to 480 gigabyte per second. Now, on the right side is where we'll be focusing for the rest of the talk, which is between the node, how do you interconnect these GPUs together, right? If you use TCP IP-based uh, mechanism sockets, you would very soon... Uh, be CPU bound, right? Because CPU, uh, it's CPU bound, it has to still frame a lot of packets, it has to send it out. So it will be CPU bound, high latency. Uh, Rocky, on the other hand, or infinite band based network, it's all GPU to GPU uh, DMA, right? A GPU direct DMA. It, it's not CPU bound, it's low latency. But if you have to match 
the envilling speed on the left side with the internode connectivity, we have to bring in a lot of NICs, right? You have one bare metal node. If you have a bare metal node with eight GPUs, you would need eight NICs, and each GPU have its own corresponding NIC, and each of the GPU on that node will have its own NIC, and this NIC will feed the hungry GPU with the data, and it's not like you have eight GPUs with one NIC. It won't scale because that single NIC, even if you use infinite band, will be the bottleneck. So you would have eight GPUs, and each GPU will have its own NIC, therefore eight NICs, and those eight NICs connect to another node with eight NICs and eight GPU. So um, let's look at the, uh, so that's the idea, right? You have multi-node uh, setup, and you have GPUs on it, and each GPU have its own NIC, and now the ask here is how do we interconnect it, and obviously uh, RDMA uh, and, and then Rocky would be the way to do it, is what our claim here is. Um, so let's look at the uh, pod networking here, right? So uh, there are three things like I was saying. One is the OSS stack that runs on the node. And the second thing is uh, the network adapters. And the third thing is the fabric. So on the node, we use three components. One is called the open virtual switch. And uh, on top of this open virtual switch, we have an SDN control plane called open virtual network. And finally, this OVN SDN is configured by a CNI. Which, is, which we call as Oven Kubernetes, okay? We are going to uh, deep dive into each one of this OSS component soon. Now, this so software stack on the node um, uh, kind of works alongside with the adapters. Some of the adapters that's out there can offload uh, the, the OVS open flow rules uh, into hardware so that we can do wire speed uh, interconnect, wire speed ACLs, wire speed uh, natting, wire speed load balancing. So you can do all of those things. Why, why wire speed is because we can offload all of these ne network services like ACL, basically firewall, load balancing, natting, and uh, natting is like SNAT, DNAT. So we could offload all those things to hardware and therefore um, the east-west uh, interconnect between the GPU uh, still runs at the wire speed. And then finally, you have the fabric, like that Leonid was talking about. Um, and then the, the other thing is, here is that uh, if you want to use, if you want to do multi-tenancy on a single data center, we need QoS just to make sure that people, like uh, uh, customers who are paying more money, uh, you can differentiate between the various customers, you know, by using QoS so that one customer is not hogging all the bandwidth. So the QoS becomes important uh, along with the network isolation. So. OBS is, uh, uh, it's, it's like a very enhanced Linux bridge. Uh, in our stack, it runs on every node, okay? And, and then OVN runs on every node, and it, it also, also has a central component. The central component is here, uh, which has a northbound DB and a southbound DB, and then there is a daemon that uh, kind of uh, take the northbound constructs and then co converts into southbound. Um, and then finally, you have the Oven Kubernetes CNI, right? Like I was saying, like our stack is layered. We have OVS running on every node, Oven running on every node plus a central component, and finally, Oven Kubernetes uh, runs on uh, uh, on every node uh, and then also has a central component. They're all deployed in Kubernetes as daemon sets and deployments and stateful set. So all of this together uh, kind of constitutes our SDN stack. Uh, and all built uh, uh, collaboratively upstream uh, with folks from Red Hat, uh, folks from uh, VMware, and, and everyone else. Um, let's dive in. Let's uh, deep dive into OVS. Okay, so OVS, like I was saying, is an open source project. Uh, it's uh, very, uh, you know, it's responsible for uh, interconnecting pods, VMs, or containers on an hypervisor. Right, interconnecting the pods are also between the pods and the external world. Um, it has a rich feature set, like you can do um, monitoring, you can do S-flow, uh, NetFlow, and then you can do fine-grained QoS. It has support for VLAN. It has support for various overlay protocols like Gini, VXLAN, STT. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the whole data plane for OVS can be offloaded to uh, various uh, NIC vendors, one of them is, of course, the NVIDIA uh, CX Smart NICs, Super NICs, and DPUs. Um, so in its simplest form, OVS has, uh, like, uh, here it has uh, both the user component and the kernel component. And what, it, in its simplest form, it's just a simple Linux bridge where it's doing Mac learning. 
right? It basically figures out where the MAC address is, right? It kind of, uh, if a packet, if in the, in the example here, there are three pods, and the three pods are part of the OVS bridge called BRET0, and then uh, it basically learns the first pod's MAC address is on VET1, VET the second pod's MAC address is on VET3. Um, so it's basically doing a simple uh, MAC uh, uh, thing, and the way it's doing that is through this normal action. Uh, where OVS shines is that it uses open flow rules, and using the open flow rules, you can create a very, it's highly programmable uh, because of this open flow rules, and using this open flow rules, you can build a pipeline. Um, so what is the open flow rule, right? It's basically a match and action, right? A packet comes in, and on that packet, you can match on the L2 headers, L3 headers, L4 headers, and based on that match, you can apply an action. The action is either to drop it in the case of ACLs, just forward it in the case if the switch is asking, acting like a forwarder, and then just pass it to the application that's on that hypervisor. So you have match and you have action. And this match and action together is called an open flow rule. And uh, on, the, on the OVS bridge, you can add thousands of these rules. And each of these rules will be compartmentalized in its own table called OVS open flow table. So these flow tables together, they form a pipeline. You have like table in the example here, right? In the, in the example here on example three, uh, we are building a VLAN capable Mac learning switch. So when the packet from the pod hits the OVS bridge, in this case, BRP0, this, this OVS bridge is um, in software, nothing but a, series of tables. So we have four or five tables here, table zero to table four, and on table zero, we make sure that uh, this packet from P1, uh, the MAC address of the packet that's coming from P1 is actually the MAC address of P1 and nothing else. So nobody's spoofing the MAC address. So if, if somebody, uh, if the pod on, on P1 is trying to send the packet uh, with the MAC address of P2, then in the admission control, we'll immediately drop it because we know that they're trying to spoof a MAC address. So uh, basically, it's a collection of tables, and each table has open flow rules, and those open flow rules can make this packet steer through various uh, tables and form a pipeline. Um, now, these open flow rules, which is the smallest unit uh, using which you can steer the packet, it can be offloaded into the hardware. So uh, on the left side, what's happening here is there's no hardware offload. The first packet enters from the wire onto the node, and in the kernel, we don't know what to do with that packet. So the first packet, we know, don't know what to do it, so we punt the packet to the user space. In the user space is where OVS is running, and the packet goes through this open flow pipeline, and at the end of the pipeline, we know whether to drop the packet, forward the packet, or send it to the uh, pod running on the node. Once we figure out the fate of the, of the packet, we are going to push the packet uh, uh, into the OVS kernel module. The subsequent packets on the same traffic will now be matched in the kernel. It does not have to go to the user land. And, and therefore, uh, all of the packets, second, third, fourth, and all the packets till the connection terminates is now directly matched in the kernel. So with hardware offload, what we have done is, whatever is there in the kernel, we have pushed it to hardware. So the first packet comes onto the hardware. We don't know what to do it. We check in the kernel. We don't know what to do it. We send it to the user land. User land through the open flow pipeline, we figure out what needs to be done. And then we push that rule to the Linux kernel using TC. And TC rules are offloaded to the hardware. Now the second packet, when it arrives on the node, it's already in the hardware and we know what to do. And therefore, that's why we say it's wire speed and therefore, um, nothing uh, for a subsequent packet, nothing needs to be done in the kernel or the user land. Um, so this slide basically says the same thing. Um, uh, we are actually, uh, the, the, the construct at which we have offloaded uh, is a TC, okay? The TC, so, so if any, anything that is using TC can be offloaded and OVS uses TC underneath in the Linux and then that gets offloaded uh, with DPTK, it's RTE flow. Obviously, uh, there's CPU savings. If everything is offloaded, then the CPU on the host uh, does not have to spend a whole lot of time. Um, so uh, this whole thing is called programmable SROV. And uh, uh, basically, the, the, the takeaway from this slide is uh, the obvious data path can be offloaded. And therefore, we can do everything wire speed. Uh, ACLs, like the pod, the ACLs on this pod can be wire speed. 
denatting, snatting on this part can be wire speed. So we now just covered the OVS part, which runs on every node. What OVN does is it leverages this open flow uh, pipeline uh, on each node, and then it programs this OVS. Instead of uh, us manually programming these thousands of flows, OVN on the northbound side gives us a very higher level construct, logical switch, logical router, ACLs. So the CMS, the cloud management system or the CNI, configures this northbound and the OVN control plane takes this logical constructs and then translates that into open flow pipeline. So the OVN is that SDN layer which provides one with the logical constructs and then on the southbound side, it translates that into open flow rules. So in that way, the open flow rules becomes very manageable because we are interacting with OVN at a very high level. You know, give me two logical switches, interconnect. Uh, so for example here, right, uh, we create two logical switch, L0 and L1, and we say, hey, interconnect that with a logical router. See, all we, uh, there's a command like here, Avan NB cutter northbound, right? And then we are adding a router, we're adding two logical switch, and to L0, we're adding a logical port called LP0, right? And then to this logical switch port, we assign all the attributes of the networking. What should be the MAC address of it be? What should be the IP address be? What should the MTU be? What should be the ACL of that particular thing? Should we enable port security on it or not? Should it have DHCP support? In so we kind of using software define various attributes on this logical switch port and that becomes the API. On the node here, right, you have two nodes, node one and node two. So VM0, let's say it's a, it's a QMU KVM VM. It came up with Vertio front end and back end. The back end device, the VNet0, right, we added it to the obvious bridge. And then we tell that physical port, hey, you're married or you're bound to this particular logical switch port. So in this case, VM0 is bound to LP0 and VM1 is bound to LP1 and LP0 is a logical port on this thing. So now, through this binding, that physical interface now has, it kind of downloads all the attributes of the logical switch that you define through software. So that's the connection between the physical entity on the node. That's how we connect the physical entity on the node to the, uh, the logical uh, abstraction that we did at the SDN layer. Um, and then the blue line here is Geneve, okay? So one other thing that uh, OVN does is it takes a physical network, right? And then virtualizes that physical network by creating logical topologies. You, let's say you have a data center where you have racked and stacked bunch of physical nodes, and then you've interconnected that with the physical fabric. If you want to do multi-tenancy, you could sure carve out VLANs and then do uh, your network isolation. But with OVN, what we do is we use OLA protocols like Geneve. Uh, Geneve stands for Generic Network Virtualization Encapsulation. It's an extension to VXLAN, right? VXLAN with overlays gives you that network isolation. But Geneve was uh, written because we saw a lot of um, drawbacks in VXLAN because VXLAN did not have enough uh, uh, space in the, in the header, VXLAN header to differentiate or carry additional metadata. VXLAN did not have that provision. So Geneve is this particular overlay protocol where we can add up to 256 bytes of metadata into that particular header on the wire. So using uh, TLVs. So with that metadata, we can do a lot of differentiation on the fabric. So Geneve is what we use for overlay and that overlay is used for uh, network virtualization. Um, then finally, so we've covered OVS on every node and we've covered OVN and OVN we said uh, uh, provides one with uh, logical abstractions like switches and routers. Now the CNI, right, the oven Kubernetes CNI is basically talks to the OVN northbound and then creates this logical topology, right? Um, yeah, it's a lot of things there. In here it's a three node Kubernetes cluster. Every node has a logical switch and to that logical switch connects the pods on that node. And these logical switches, right? Node, uh, node one, node two, node three, they're interconnected by a logical router. And this logical router uh, has a gateway through which it can exit out for north-south. If the pod on node one wants to talk to pod on node two, uh, it just goes through the overlay between uh, node one to node two, okay? So it, uh, the east-west is through the overlay. 
let's say if this pod wants to talk to the internet, then it would, uh, uh, you know, bec because it's not east-west anymore, it would exit out uh, through this router and through the gateway. So gateway is this construct where the logical topology is connected to the underlay network. So it's like a, any, any other gateways out there, like a physical gateway. So, so this is how uh, we have defined the logical topology for a CNI, and, and then it kind of uh, fulfills, like for any CNI to call itself a CNI, it has to fulfill around eight network flows. And what we have done is through this logical topology that we have built, uh, we have uh, fulfilled east-west communication between the pod for the kubelet to talk to the pod, for the pods to talk to the internet. So this topology uh, kind of fulfills all those network flows, and therefore we can call ourselves a CNI. Um, so, uh, and then one thing I want to say here is uh, for every Kubernetes custom resource we have, there is a corresponding uh, OVN logical constructs. Like in the case of network policy, you have OVN ACLs, uh, in the case of uh, pod, right, pod has interfaces, right, and, and then that interface is bound to a logical switch port. So for every Kubernetes resource, there is a corresponding OVN northbound logical construct, and that's how our controller running kind of maps the logical, you know, maps that Kubernetes CR to the thing. So let's quickly now go to the, yeah, this is how it would look like at the end of the day uh, with all the three components running in a, in a DC. So let's look at uh, how a data center where deep learning training um, uh, occurs, right? Like how, how does a DC look like? And then what is the physical networking on top of it? So uh, in here, there are, two cube there are two nodes on the left, right? And, and then what we have done is we have one fat pod that has consumed all the GPUs, right? And, and then for each of the GPU, like I was saying at the beginning, has a corresponding NIC. So there are eight GPUs in this pod, and correspondingly, there are eight physical NICs onto the pod. So in a rail-optimized DC, what we do is the, the, all the NICs, right, all the NICs with the same index, they connect to the same switch. So what do I mean is the PF1 on all the nodes, on all the 1,000 nodes, PF1, they connect to the same leaf switch. Uh, and all the PF3, they connect to the same switch. So what this gives is that when GP1 wants to talk to GP1 of uh, other nodes, they just talk through the leaf, leaf uh, switch itself. They don't have to go to the spine. So that forms um, rails, like a railway track, there are rails. So all the, all the, G, like all the nodes, right, GP1 on all nodes, they talk to each other using rail one. GPU 2 on all the roads, they talk to each other with rail 2. GPU 3 on all the nodes, they talk to each other with rail 3, right? So it's all uh, kind of um, rail, and there is uh, hardly any routing between them on the fabric. So with that, what happens is you don't have to go to the spine and then have routing collusion, and all of the switch ports in the fabric is effectively used for east west and then there is you know if you if you don't have a you know if you don't have an unblocking un non non blocking leaf spine thing uh, this one will help because you don't go to spine at all everything happens in the leaf let's say for example uh, gpu4 here right gpu4 it wants to talk to gpu1 what happens in one of the cases is uh, on the gpu4 will directly talk to gpu1 locally through the NV switch, and then GPU1 will use the PF1 and talk to GPU1. So if you want, if the GPUs want to talk cross, uh, across, you know, in a cross configuration, the first hop is within the node because that NV link or PCI is much faster. So you do the first hop within that node and then use the rail corresponding to that GPU on that first node and then go there. So in that way, GPU3 is, talks to GPU1 with first stop within the node and then uses the rail for that thing. Um, so this is the physical view of the whole thing, correct? Um, now, um, you know, uh, how does, how do we now uh, build a logical view of this thing? So what we do here is uh, basically for every rail, which is east-west layer two, we create a OVN logical switch. So there are eight rails, right? There are eight rails, so we create eight logical switch. 
So on the rail one logical switch, let's say there's a thousand node cluster, right? On rail one logical switch, you would have thousand ports, thousand logical switch ports, and each of the logical switch port will correspond to PF1 on those thousand nodes. Uh, on the rail two logical switch, you will have thousand ports, and it will correspond to PF2 on those nodes. So basically, we would create um, eight logical switch that will create the rail between the PFs, between the nodes, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, and then we would apply ACLs and QoS just to make sure that uh, when you have multi-tenancy, um, there is no one tenant hogging up all the, all the bandwidth. So, next one. Yeah, this is even more detailed view. What is, what's basically doing here is that, uh, like, I'm, I've zoomed into each of the node, and then on, if you look at the Kubernetes node one on the top, you have OVS running alongside with OVN, alongside with CNI, and you have this Kubernetes pod one with eight GPUs assigned to it, and then, and then for each of the GPU, there is a corresponding virtual function from the PF, and then uh, uh, now we overlay put the overlay on top of it, right? Because overlay, why is overlay needed? Again, if you have multiple tenants, correct? In this example here, see if you have multiple tenants, right? You have tenant A and tenant B. If they want, uh, and tenant A has 500 nodes and tenant B has 500 nodes, and they want to talk to each other east-west, and, and then they don't want to, uh, you know, by creating this logical topologies, you can isolate them in, in a way that uh, it, there's no need for sharing those logical topologies. We could also share it, but uh, you know, we'll have to use Kubernetes network policies, but if the tenants are, um, for whatever reason, very uh, paranoid about it, we could create multiple logical switches and in each logical switch for each tenant. Uh, in that way, the east-west is uh, uh, fulfilled. Um, so, yeah, the Geneve, like I was saying, uh, it's an overlay protocol. Uh, it has, uh, uh, it was written um, because VLX, VXLAN was not uh, there yet, and uh, uh, Geneve uh, provides a way to add more metadata, and then with that extra metadata, you can uh, do fancy things on the fabric. Um, so with that, yeah, so all, all we wanted to show was uh, that you could May, we, can, we could build your own uh, AI, uh, uh, you know, data centers with OSS components out there, and uh, Rocky is a way to kind of achieve the speed. Um, and then the whole uh, project uh, which uses OVN, OVS, and Oven Kubernetes, they're all OSS based. And uh, please join us to advance this project at OvenKubernetes.io. Uh, in fact, we are using this already uh, in our data centers uh, for game streaming. We are trying to um, also use the same stack for deep learning, but we are already using this for game streaming. So if you are uh, playing games uh, out of NVIDIA's GPU through GeForce Network, I don't know if you, how many of you guys know about GFN. Um, oh, great. <laughs> so if you are playing uh, games off of GFN today, uh, it's all being streamed out of uh, the data center backed by this OSS software, OVN, OVS, and Avon Kubernetes CNI. Uh, there's some pretty neat uh, uh, references to uh, Nickel and how to do large-scale uh, GPU training using Nickel out there, uh, so have to take a look. So, yeah, I'm done here, and we're open to questions. If there are any. So I had to rush through the whole thing at the end, but... Thank you. <laughs>